As long ago as 1938, Lowe Design had assumed the dominant position in aircraft construction the world over. The combined speed and efficiency of the low-wing monoplane had proved itself time and time again. Yet, we continued to train pilots in biplanes which were not wholly unlike these old horses. Something like trying to ride a motorcycle after getting primary instruction on a tricycle. By 1938, the need had grown acute for a primary trainer that would provide students with direct continuity of training right from the start. The Air Corps felt that if pilots would be required to fly heavy fast landing jobs eventually, they should get the feel of such ships in the beginning. Therefore, a request went out to the industry for one company in particular was well equipped to turn out these ships, Fairchild. Sherman Fairchild had been solving tough aeronautical problems for years, beginning with his invention of the aerial camera and the first enclosed cabin plane to fly it in. And his company had the practical experience for the job. Experience gained in building a long line of rugged, efficient airplanes, many of which became justly famous. The F-71, for instance, Admiral Byrd's supply ship on both South Pole expeditions. The F-45, a high-speed private cruiser for five. The L-31, a cargo plane which could carry more than two tons. The F-24, Ranger-powered, could take four people and baggage into and out of the tightest field. The Fairchild Baby Clipper, another great achievement in design and construction. The Baby Clipper was built expressly for Pan American feeder service in tropical waters. Another example of designing and building a ship for specific duties. With this background of experience, Armand Tiablo, Fairchild's chief engineer, approached the task of developing this low-wing primary trainer. First of all, the ship had to look, feel, and fly like tactical types now in service. And the big problem was to overcome the stall characteristics of conventional tapered airfoils, so dangerous to fledgling pilots. The conventional low-wing monoplane stalls from the tip inward. At an angle of attack of six degrees, the wing still flies. At eight degrees, you can see the stall begin. At 10 degrees, the tip is stalled. At 12 degrees, the aileron has lost its efficiency. Lateral control is gone. At 14 degrees and 15 degrees, the entire wing has lost its flying power. Here is the way the Fairchild wing stalls. It also flies at six degrees, just like the conventional low wing. At an angle of attack of eight degrees, ends not at the tip, but one third of the way out on the trailing edge. At 10 degrees, the aileron is still 100% effective. At 12 degrees, it spreads only one half way across the aileron. Even at 14 degrees, part of the aileron is effective. At 15 degrees, the end of the tip is still flying. Compare the two wings at an angle of attack of 12 degrees. In the conventional wing, the aileron is out of action and the plane will spin. But on the Fairchild wing at 12 degrees, half the aileron is still effective. The student pilot feels the flutter of the stall but still has lateral control to save him from spins. Now here's the Fairchild wing in the air. The wool tufts lie flat when the wing is actually flying and rise in the turbulent air which causes the stall. The airspeed drops. Now watch the tufts. Notice how the stall begins a third of the way out on the trailing edge, then spreads forward and outward. Vibration warns the pilot but the wing tip is still flying. Once more, forward and outward. The pilot feels the stall, yet the tips still fly. He has aileron control. He does not spin. Yes, safety is the keynote of the PT-19's design and of its construction too. The wing is ruggedly built. 
Yet because of sound engineering, it needs no cross bracings which would add weight. Here's why cumbersome tie rods are unnecessary. This one piece plywood skin gives the wing its required rigidity. The skin is stressed to meet the stiffest Air Force standards. The tip is made even tougher. This eight-ply laminated construction will stand the gaff even if a student pilot should hook a wing. In the paint shop, filler is first rubbed into the wood. This vigorous action shows that the wing structure can take a real pounding. Once the filler has set, the wing is sprayed with a paint especially developed and tested for this purpose. Down in Florida, it was put to every test possible. Blistering sun, tropical showers, dousings with ocean water, and acid baths. And today, chipped and peeling paint is no longer a maintenance headache. Ruggedness and durability are vitally important in a primary trainer. This center section spar shows how the inside of the plane is built to take day in and day out beatings over a period of months without more than routine attention. It is made in deep section of laminated fine grain ash. This same rugged strength is built into all parts of the airplane. The landing gear casing looks like a small howitzer and is just as tough. Designed and tested to withstand the roughest kind of primary stage landings. Even the smallest parts must meet rigid specifications. As the center section is assembled, the forged hardware and the chromium steel fittings installed by a portable jig contribute to built-in strength and rigidity. Expert joiners and cabinet makers put on the finishing touches before the center section is covered. After the skin is on, it is ready for the paint shop. All wood parts are sprayed with Bakelite varnish to keep out moisture in any form, thereby eliminating a major maintenance problem. Metal parts, too, are protected against moisture. In the steel tube fuselage, hot linseed oil is pumped from the lowest point through every member until it flows out the top under pressure. Drained and sealed, it gives positive protection against all interior corrosion. And to protect the exterior surfaces, the sandblast treatment. Under 250 pounds pressure, every atom of rust which might cling to the tubing is blasted away on the surface prepared for the aluminum paint. Another example of sound engineering is the PT-19 engine mount. Simplicity itself, but good and husky too. Its greatest advantage is the ease and speed with which engines can be changed. The engine is a complete unit ready to swing into place. The entire mount is held to the fuselage by only five chromium steel bolts, each handily placed, two on the bottom and three on top. Driving home all five bolts takes less than one minute, and there's the new engine in place. All that remains is to hook up the gadgets, the oil pressure and temperature gauges, shutters, tack shafts and ignition wiring, Two men can do the whole job in less than half an hour. In the Fairchild plant, every possible development toward the production line method has been adopted. Here the center section is wheeled into line and made fuselage coming forward on an overhead rail. It is lowered into place, bolted on, and the complete assembly rolled ahead to make room for the next one. Next, two men on each side install the flaps, hand-actuated flaps that travel a full 90 degrees. Then they are carefully tested. PT-19 flap action is identical to big ship feel and action. Low wing monoplanes require a minimum of effort in hanging wings. First remove the steel bolts from the steel compression rib fittings. Then simply walk the wings into place. The steel compression members in outer panel and center section fit to the thousandth of an inch. Just drive the bolts home.
The PT-19 has adjustable seats in both cockpits. They can be raised or lowered half an inch at a time by a conveniently placed control lever. Or to suit the occupant's fancy. Also, the rudder pedals are adjustable to three leg lengths. Fingertip pressure is all that is required to release this safety catch. The steerable tail wheel operates on a throwout latch that prevents interference with the rudder action. Compare the travel between the wheel and the rudder. Control rods must be of large diameter to ensure rigidity, but swaged at the ends to hold ball bearings for smooth operation. Swaging the rods is a tough job, but Fairchild devised this ingenious method using an ordinary lathe with the necessary extrusion dies. Doing the swaging right here in the same plant avoids the possibility of a bottleneck from outside sources and changes can easily be made to fill special requirements. The entire system of controls carries out the safety theme. Positive push and pull rods are used throughout this plane. Gone are the pulleys and cables that stuck and stretched and wore and broke. Employing bell cranks to afford correct leverage, this type of control is accurate and smooth in operation. Standing there on the line, the PT-19 will meet the most critical inspection. Sturdiness and the wide tread of the wheels prevent ground loops by the most inexperienced student. The safety factor of the landing gear is 10, which exceeds Air Force requirements by three. Before we see the ship fly, let's take a look at the power plant, the Ranger engine. Here for the first time is an inline air-cooled engine in quantity production. Air is brought into all six cylinders under pressure, instead of sticking the cylinders out into the air to spoil streamlining. Ranger has proved its efficiency in thousands of hours of daily service, winter and summer, from Canada to the tropics. That efficiency is the result of careful engineering and rigid testing. For instance, all castings are tested for hidden blowholes before the part is machined. Here a crankcase is being given this porosity test. The part is first weighed dry and then placed in a tank of water. It is turned over several times to release air bubbles that may be trapped in odd corners. After this, it is weighed again under water. Any difference between its submerged weight and that of a known perfect casting indicates defects and the part is rejected. These cylinder heads and barrels have been tested and found perfect. Putting them together looks easy, but there's a real story behind it. Right out of the oven comes the cylinder head, heated to expand the metal. It's set in a vise for assembly with the barrel. Split-second timing is required. The head must not cool too much. From an ice box comes the barrel, contracted by cold so that it will just fit into the heated cylinder head. Both speed and care are needed, not a single waste motion. The head's almost ready. There it is. The threads are greased, and here comes the cylinder barrel. Spun down to a tight fit, the head cools and contracts. The barrel expands. At normal temperatures, an inseparable bond results. The finished cylinder gets a high pressure spraying with melted aluminum. Every bit of the surface of the intricate casting is covered to prevent rust and corrosion under any conditions. This machine electrically measures the vibration of crankshafts, another example of precision manufacturing methods. The part to be tested is securely locked in, then revolved at various engine speeds. Unerringly, the machine picks out any flaw that would set up a damaging vibration in this vital part. 
The slightest irregularity thus revealed is marked for correction. If it cannot be corrected and pass the test, it is rejected. The latest and most efficient machines and production methods are used. Gang drills like this one bore all the bolt holes in the crankcase in one single operation. Similar many purpose machines are used throughout the factory. After the crankcase is assembled, the engine is turned over and the pistons installed. Then the overhead camshaft is dropped into place and timed. Timed once and for all. Not until the engine is overhauled will there be the slightest reason to worry about valve adjustments. For the cams operate directly against the rockers, thereby eliminating all possibility of maladjustment through changes in push rods. A final check in the test cells, equipped with the latest devices for measuring every phase of engine performance. Temperatures from that of the tropics to the 50 below zero of the stratosphere can be created in these cells. These engines must perform efficiently under all conditions. Ranger, of course, is air-cooled. Even at idling speed, this scoop gets enough air for normal temperature in all six cylinders. The scoop is closed at the back. Pressure is equal throughout, so air flows evenly across all six cylinders and out on this other side. Next is a seemingly small item, yet thanks to this foresight, neither dust nor grasshoppers clog carburation. The air maze, easy to reach and check, positively prevents foreign matter from entering the carburetor breather. All service points are easy to reach. Ground crews don't have to climb around on this ship. Simply reach over and insert the gasoline hose. Another point that appeals to all pilots is that of personal comfort. It's easy to get in and out. Here's a demonstration of how quickly an emergency departure can be made. Get the ripcord, boy. Inside the cockpit are the standard control locks, handbrake, and trimming tab. Now to see the ship perform. After a quick, easy start, the pilot is ready to taxi out. The white strip on the nose of the ship is used to blank out the serial number. Here is visible proof of quick takeoff and lusty climb. Note how the plane is in easy lateral control during the climb when students need control to prevent spins. It is in the air that this ship really comes into its own. Visibility dead ahead and downward where the pilot needs it most is unrivaled in the PT-19. See how the pilot in either cockpit can see the camera ship below and in front of him until... Watch this other ship come streaking out of the haze. Further proof of visibility. Watch this one cross over in front. The view straight astern is perfect too. And with the rear view mirror in the front cockpit, the instructor can keep close watch on the students' reactions at all times. The PT-19 can take a thorough ringing out. Expert or tyro performance makes no difference. Try her out, anything you want. Half snap. Snap roll. They say it's easy. 
that the slow roll is hard. Well, here's a slow roll. Inverted flying. There you are, upside down. She hangs there, holding her altitude like a good soldier. Thanks to the excellent forward visibility, student formation practice is free of one serious hazard, blind spots that lead to collisions. For the same reason, it becomes virtually impossible to land on top of another ship. Notice the ship down at the far end of the runway. And on the ground, the view ahead remains good, equally good from either seat. That's PT-9 over the slim nose of the closely cowled Ranger engine. That means safety on the busy training fields of these war days. Remember that landing gear? Here's how it works. Over and over again in those 10-foot high student landings. And ground loops? Well, watch this. Here's where those wide-treaded landing wheels do their stuff. Keep the ship upright, save wing tips, and students' necks. This must be a Chinese coming in for a landing. Our old friend, one wing low. Yet the ship is under perfect control. Slam her down. Swing her around. She can take it. These things you shouldn't do, but they sometimes happen. Just as bad as the first time, but still under control and safe. Yes, the PT-19 is a ship designed, engineered, and built for a specific mission. It has the safety characteristics so necessary in a primary trainer. Dick Boutel, Fairchild's general manager, who has been engineering, testing, and flying airplanes since the last war, Chairman Fairchild and President J. Carlton Ward all have reason to be proud of the PT-19. Not only is it used throughout our own training areas, but all over the world, in Chile, Brazil, Ecuador, Uruguay, here in Canada with the Norwegian. Here, the ship's performance in extremes of weather, in the snows of winter, or flying under summer suns, is further proof of its sound design and of the Ranger engine's efficiency. Largely due to Fairchild all-weather performance with the Norwegians, the Royal Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force have adopted the PT-19. They have named it the Cornell and are making it in Canada under Fairchild license for their own elementary training, including cross-country, blind, and instrument flight. For this, the Ranger engine has been increased to 200 horsepower. But it is in our own busy training area that day after day the PT-19 has proved its worth by hundreds of thousands of hours of pounding primary training at parks in East St. Louis, Spartan at Tulsa, Hicks Field at Fort Worth throughout the Southwest training area. By thousands, the budding pilots taxi out onto the busy runways for the daily grueling grind. More and more PT-19s go into service with the rapid expansion of our training program. Fairchild is proud to have a part in this gigantic effort. And the men who are doing the real job, the men of the Army Air Forces. of thousands of airplanes. That's what America's building, 
That's what America's flying. Bombers and interceptors, fighters and training planes. These are the wings of victory. And down here on the ground, well, that's where we come in. We're the mechanics who service these ships. We're the men who keep them flying. Inspection, overhaul, maintenance. Finding trouble before trouble finds us. That's our job. And it's a job that leaves no margin for error. Our work must be thorough and complete. With us, there can be no little things. The cottering of a nut, the safetying of a turnbuckle. These might mean the difference between life and death to your pilot. Let's not ever forget that. In this film, we'll explain the methods and procedure used in servicing two primary training planes, the PT-19A and the PT-23. From rudder to firewall, these two ships are identical. The tail assembly is constructed of plywood. The fuselage is welded steel tubing, fabric covered and doped. The wings, like the tail assembly, are of plywood structure throughout and are covered with plywood sheeting. From here forward, we see the difference between the PT-19A and the PT-23. The PT-19A is powered with a six-cylinder inverted Ranger engine. The PT-23 has a seven-cylinder radial Continental engine. The procedure of inspection on these two engines is much the same although, of course, the location of parts will differ. These differences will be noted and explained as we go along. The pre-flight inspection is basically an overall visual checkup of the ship and is to be made prior to the first flight of the day. We'll start things off by seeing that the fuel tanks are full. Since the fuel gauge will not function properly unless the ship is in flight position, we'll have to remove the inspection panel and cap from each of the wing tanks and check the fuel level visually. It is also good practice to double check by testing with your finger, like this. In replacing the tank cap and panel, be certain both are securely fastened. Next, we'll check the oil supply. The tank should be at maximum capacity. The finger test will help you make sure that the fluid level reaches well up into the filler neck. On the radial type engine, the oil tank inspection panel is located on top, just forward of the firewall. If the ship stands idle for any length of time, even overnight, water may condense from the fuel and collect at certain low points on the ship. For example, one of these points will be the fuel strainer. When you drain the fuel strainer, always catch the runoff in a clean glass jar. This will help you discover the presence of water or any foreign matter in the fuel. And if the fuel is not absolutely pure, disassemble the strainer inspect the screen, and flush out the fuel line. We have seen that in order to make this inspection, we first had to cut safety wires on the petcock. These safety wires must be replaced, not some time later, but immediately after the job is done. Apply this rule to all cottering and all resafetying throughout the ship. The fuel tank sumps will also be points in the fuel system where water will collect. Make your inspection here just as you did on the fuel strainer. And while you're on this job, inspect these pet cocks carefully. Because of their position here under the wings, they are constantly subject to damage from flying rocks and gravel and should be replaced if any defects are found. Again, after examining the fuel, don't forget to re-safety the petcocks.
Keeping our ships clean, free from grease and dirt, is an important part of our job. When you inspect the oleo struts, for instance, wipe them down before you do anything else. Then check the nutcracker. Any side play here will indicate worn bolt holes. Inspect the hydraulic line for breaks, defects, and possible fluid leakage. Wipe down the wheel and dust cover and make sure that both are secure. Open the boot and check the extension of the oil and spring oleo strut. Use your rule for this purpose. And if the extension is less than the specified distance of two and three quarters inches, disassemble the entire strut and check for a broken spring. Always be certain that the tires are kept well inflated. Underinflation will measurably shorten the life of the tire by causing breakdown of the casing, as well as excess rubber wear. A soft, mushy tire is a sure indication of a careless mechanic. On these ships, the tail wheel is equipped with an inflation line, such as the white ring, which is clearly visible here. When the tire is properly inflated, the bottom of this ring will be just clear of the floor. There, that's it. Now replace the valve cap and the cover plate. The propeller, winding out better than a thousand RPM, necessarily subjects the shaft to certain stresses and strains. And the prop itself is always liable to damage from flying rocks and gravel. When inspecting the propeller, even if the ship has been standing idle, first be sure that the switch is in the off position. Then check the prop for looseness in the hub. Inspect the blades carefully for splits or any spreading between the laminations of the wood. Check for loose rivets and damage to the tips. Examine all surfaces, wood and metal, for the presence of cracks, dents and similar defects. If your inspection does not show the propeller to be in the best of condition, do not hesitate to take it off and replace it. The pitot tube is a precision instrument designed for the purpose of measuring air speeds. If it should become crimped or bent, it will cease to function properly. You might bear that in mind when you're tempted to use it for a convenient coat hanger. The head of the pitot tube is pierced by a series of slots known as static holes. These admit air to an inner chamber and must be kept clean at all times. A second inner tube, called a pressure head, is perforated near the end by a number of small round holes. These holes transmit air through tubes to the instruments. They are vital to the proper functioning of the airspeed indicator, and so must be cleaned regularly. Inspect the pitot tube by making sure that it is securely mounted, properly aligned, and perfectly straight. Examine the mouth of the tube for dirt or obstruction, and clean all holes with a soft copper wire. Inspect the gap cover turnbuckles. See that they are tight and properly safetyed. Check the gap covers for security. Inspect the center section and the wings for any defects. Watch out for unusual depressions in the plywood. These would indicate serious breakdown of interior structure. Inspect the ailerons by first noting the general condition of the skin. Next, examine the hinges for signs of cracking. See that all nuts are secure and properly cottered. Be particularly careful in checking for binding or excess play. These hinges are bolted directly to the wooden wing spar. 
If the bolt holes in this bar become worn, the ship must be grounded until repairs are made. The flaps must be kept in first class working condition. Check them for proper alignment with the trailing edge of the wing. See that they hold firmly in place at halfway position. Now try them at full down. During landing and taxiing, the flaps often take a pretty bad beating. Flying rocks and gravel will cause splits and cracks. Be on the lookout for them. A bad crack may be detected from either side of the flap and calls for immediate replacement of the entire assembly. The inspection of the elevators is similar to that of the ailerons. Check the hinges for freedom of movement. Watch for binding or side play. Visually inspect all surfaces to see that they are in good condition. Be sure the hinges are securely attached to the spar. Now, apply this same detailed inspection to the rudder. When inspecting the cockpit, but wait, let's hold it a minute. Notice that this mechanic is watching his step. He's taking no chances on cracking the thin plywood covering of the wing. He stays on the walkway. Get the idea? Okay, let's go ahead. In the cockpit, after cleaning the cover glass on the altimeter, set it to station altitude, or as directed by your pilot. See that all instruments are secure. And be sure that the white mark on the bottom of each case lines up exactly with the corresponding white mark on each of the cover glasses. Tapping the airspeed indicator gently will show you if the needle has become stuck or is working freely. Wipe down all cover glasses. Wind the clock and check it for the correct time. Inspect the speaking tube for possible breaks or other defects. See that the line is flexible and securely mounted. Check the action of the fuel tank selector valves by turning the control lever completely around. Be sure you can feel it click as the valve to each tank opens. Check the flight controls for freedom of movement. At the same time, watch the control surfaces to see that they are properly coordinated with the stick and rudder pedals. Now, center the controls and see that the surfaces neutralize correctly. Check the elevator trim tab controls or any binding or excess play in the system. When you leave the cockpit, don't forget the safety belt. See that the webbing is in good condition. Inspect and test the hardware. And make sure the release is working properly. If your ship is to be flown solo, a loose belt in the unoccupied cockpit might easily foul the controls. Fasten it across the seat, like this. A loose cushion in this cockpit spells trouble with a capital T. Keep the cockpit free of anything that isn't fastened down and stow the cushions in the baggage compartment where they belong. Besides two cushions, this compartment must contain the starter crank, the mooring kit, and the tool kit. This is required standard equipment. 
So be sure that all items are present and accounted for. And now wind up your pre-flight inspection by thoroughly checking the windshields. Make sure that the frames are secure. And while you're cleaning the shields and rear vision mirror, note the condition of the weather stripping. It should, of course, be free from all defects. Well, that does it. Now make the necessary entries in the flight report Form 1A and initial it. Warming up the engine is part of our daily job. But first see that the wheels are chocked. And before you touch the propeller, check with the cockpit to make sure the switch is off. OK? Now pull the prop through two or three revolutions to clear the cylinders of oil. After the man in the cockpit has built up pressure in the fuel lines by working the wobble pump, prime the engine two or three times. Then be sure to close and lock the valve. Set the mixture at full rich and open the throttle slightly. OK? Now with the switch on, twist your tail. Hold it to about 800 RPM, which is the proper speed for warming up. When the engine is warmed up, open the throttle to about 1,200 RPM and check the engine gauge. The fuel pressure should be at 3 pounds, the oil pressure at 60 pounds, and the temperature at 70 degrees centigrade. Test the magnetos by running the engine on each one separately. There should be no considerable drop in RPM on either mag. Now cut the switch and the engine should cease firing immediately. Should the engine continue to run, kill it by turning off the fuel supply, then check for a faulty ground connection. After flight, the ship should be refueled as soon as possible. The presence of air in a partially filled tank permits the fuel to vaporize. Water will form on the walls of the tank and drip back into the fuel supply, creating a highly dangerous condition that might even result in complete engine failure. During the fueling process, a single static spark might cause the total loss of the ship. As a precaution against fire and explosion, be sure the fuel nozzle is properly grounded to the plane before opening the tank cover. Now fuel the ship with gasoline of the specified octane rating. Check the fuel level visually and see that all fittings are secure before you leave the job. Protect the pitot tube by replacing the cover immediately after flight. The daily inspection may be performed at any time during the day. It may be made after flight or it may be combined with the pre-flight. First remove the necessary cowling. Then visually inspect the entire engine section. Note the condition of the engine mounts and examine them carefully for any defects, especially at the welds. Check the induction manifold for leakage around the gaskets. Inspect the engine control linkage for proper alignment and see that all attaching brackets are secure. Check the fuel line connections for leaks and note the condition of the rubber. Check the carburetor. 
Examine the line connections and parting surfaces for possible leaks. Inspect the carburetor air cleaner housing and the elbow couplings for any defects and see that the mountings are secure. On the other side of the engine, note the general condition of the oil cooling system. Look for defects in the air duct and check the security of the mounting brackets. Inspect the exhaust stacks and pay particular attention to the wells. Sooner or later, due to the alternate heating and cooling of the system, cracks will form. Be on the lookout for them. Check the oil line connections for leaks and see that the rubber is in good condition. On the radial engine, you will apply the same visual inspection to all parts and fittings. Check the air scoop, the air cleaner, the elbow coupling, the carburetor, the induction pipes, and the exhaust and intake manifold. In general, see that all parts are in good condition and free of defects. Make sure that all attaching brackets are secure. The carburetor air cleaner protects the carburetor by filtering out dust and dirt. It must be inspected daily. If the screen is found to be clogged, it must be thoroughly cleaned. With an air hose, blow out all the loose dust and grit. Then, using a suitable solvent and a brush, wash out all the old oil. Now, use the air hose again to dry it out. When you've finished this cleaning and drying process, saturate the carburetor air cleaner in light oil. Now hang the part in a convenient place and allow two or three hours, if possible, for draining. The oil cooler intake must be inspected daily and kept free of obstructions. If this duct is allowed to become clogged, the oil may overheat and faulty lubrication will result. Whenever you wash down the ship, use soft brushes, sponges, and rags, and apply water in small quantities. If you use a hose, be sure the water is not under great pressure, as this can cause serious damage to the ship by penetrating into the wood structure and weakening the glue joints. When your ship is on the line, warmed up, ready for flight, it's a pretty swell feeling to know that your pilot can take over with perfect confidence. Yes, he can take her upstairs now, secure in the knowledge that this ship is safe, that yours was a job well done. Here comes a student pilot for his first landing. Careful, bud. Watch that crosswind. Better slack off a little. You're coming in pretty hot. Nose down. Steady, steady. Keep her level. Easy now. Easy. Boy, oh boy, that's putting it down hard. Ah, that landing gear can sure take it. But wait. Come on back. We want to see how it works. Just get her off the ground, mister. That's far enough. Hold it. Now let's move in closer and take a look at that shock assembly. That's what takes the punishment. Its function depends on a cylinder containing a piston and a heavy coil spring. 
The cylinder is charged with a special oleo fluid. As the airplane lands and the assembly compresses, the first shock is cushioned by the fluid, which passes slowly through small holes in the piston. The spring then absorbs the secondary shocks of taxiing. The detailed inspection of the landing gear is of the greatest importance. Things that may seem small to you now will look pretty important if a strut fails during landing. At the end of each 25-hour period, in addition to the usual daily inspection, the landing gear must be carefully checked and serviced. Having seen the part played by the oleo fluid in absorbing heavy landing shocks, the importance of keeping the fluid up to the proper level is evident. The level must be checked every 25 hours. To remove the filler lock nut from the top of the strut, it is first necessary to cut and remove the safety wire. Then you can loosen the nut using an offset box wrench. Attached to the lock nut is the fluid level gauge. In this case, the fluid is down and must be brought up to the proper level. The fluid specified for this purpose has a vegetable base and is intended only for use in the shock assembly and hydraulic brake system. Never use any other fluid or serious damage to the assemblies may result. Now wipe the gauge clean of dirt or grit and check the level again. Okay, right up to the mark. The level gauge indicates the true depth of the fluid only when the wheels are on the ground and the shock assembly is compressed. Remember this and you will avoid a lot of trouble. Here's the proper way to safety the filler lock nut. Anchor the wire to the screw provided at the top of the bracket. Twisting the wire enables you to get a tighter, stronger pull on the nut. Notice that the safety wire is drawn tight in the direction that prevents the nut from backing off. Now cut off the extra wire and there it is, safetyed and secure. The hydraulic brake system is very simple in this type of airplane. The reservoir is located between the cockpits. Two lines connect to the master cylinders. From the pressure ends of the cylinders, lines lead through the center section, down the oleo struts, to the brakes. Toe pressure on either pedal forces a piston forward in the corresponding cylinder. The pressure thus exerted is transmitted down the hydraulic line to the corresponding brake. The brake tube expands forcing the brake blocks against the drum. Air may collect at high points in the line, forming chains of bubbles. Its presence may be detected by a soft, spongy feel when the brakes are depressed. This is due to the bubbles compressing and absorbing the pressure intended for the brake. Air in the line will cause the brakes to operate unevenly may be responsible for a ground loop. The air is removed by a process called bleeding the line. Before starting, bring the level of the hydraulic fluid up to within one half inch of the top of the reservoir. 
Replace the filler plug and tighten it to prevent air leaks. Now, attach a hand pump to the air valve in the top of the reservoir and pump about five pounds of pressure into the tank. Since the hydraulic fluid will ruin the brake lining, place a drip shield under the bleeder fitting to keep the fluid out of the wheel. Remove the round head screw from the fitting and attach the bleeder hose. Be sure the other end of the hose is submerged in the jar of hydraulic fluid and you're ready to start. Open the bleeder valve and signal the cockpit man to press the brake pedal. This will force some fluid and some of the air out through the bleeder hose. Then close the valve and have the cockpit man release the brake. Repeat this several times, but check the supply of fluid in the reservoir at frequent intervals. If it should run dry, more air will be sucked into the line and you'll have to start all over again. Continue the process until no more air comes through the hose. Okay, all the air has been driven from the line. Now close the bleeder valve. The bleeding process is now complete for the left hydraulic line. After the bleeding equipment has been removed and the round head screw replaced, Carefully clean all excess fluid from the tire and wheel. When both lines have been properly bled, the brakes will take hold evenly and smoothly. Out of round brake drums, will constantly drag on the linings, resulting in excessive wear in a short time. To check for out of round drums, insert a feeler gauge in the inspection slots and rotate the wheel slowly. If the drum is not true, it will bind at some point. For this inspection, use a feeler gauge of 10 thousandths of an inch thickness, which is the proper clearance. If the clearance between the drum and the brake lining exceeds 15 thousandths of an inch, it indicates that the lining is badly worn and must be replaced. The expander tube type of brake used on the PT-19A and the PT-23 requires no adjustment and should never be disassembled except by a specialist in brake repair. The handbrake connects with both master cylinders by a system of cables, pulleys, and levers. To set the handbrake, first depress both foot brakes. Then turn the lever up and pull it straight back. This sets both master cylinders in the compressed position, and the brakes are locked. With the handbrake set, Go over the hydraulic line from master cylinders to wheels, checking every coupling for leaks. When the brakes are set, the lines are under pressure, and fluid will leak out through any couplings that may be loose. Check the attachment clips along the hydraulic line for security of mounting. If one should come loose, vibration would soon cause the line to break at that point. Carefully inspect the handbrake system for frayed cables and broken or misaligned pulleys and brackets. See that the cables have the proper tension and that the turnbuckle is safety. To release the handbrake, turn the lever down and let it slide all the way forward. With both the hand and the foot brakes off, there must be clearance between the locking lever and the brake lever at each master cylinder. Otherwise, there will be some pressure in the lines 
causing the brakes to drag. Make the necessary adjustment at the turnbuckle in the front cockpit. Hold the two shanks with wrenches and slack off the barrel until the proper clearance is gained between the levers. Here is the proper way to safety a turnbuckle. Adjust the three holes so the wire will go through the top one, straight down the barrel to the middle one, and straight down the opposite side to the bottom hole. If the holes are not so adjusted, and if the wire takes a quarter or a half turn around the barrel, it will lose its tension. Vibration would then cause the barrel to turn back and forth until the wire breaks. You see, there is a definite purpose behind the right way of every operation. Be sure to take at least five complete turns around each of the shanks. And you've done a good job of safetying. In lubricating the landing gear, one man should rock the airplane causing the shock assembly to extend and compress while being greased. This ensures complete distribution of the grease over the entire bearing surfaces. Wipe off excess grease from each part or it will become a trap for dirt and grit causing excessive wear. Follow the lubrication chart carefully and don't miss any of the fittings. Keep your ships well lubricated and clean and you'll avoid a lot of trouble. Lubricate the linkage of both the right and left brake systems at the pedals, at all linkage points, and at the levers in both cockpits. Lubricate the handbrake support bearings and ratchet housing, the cable pulleys, and the linkage to the master cylinders. And that finishes the 25-hour inspection of the landing gear. Whenever the front of the ship is to be jacked up, it is necessary to hang weights totaling 150 pounds to the rear lift handles. This prevents any possibility of the ship nosing over and smashing the propeller, not to mention a mechanic or two. In raising the plane, be sure the jack point is squarely centered on the jack. Remember, these are plywood wings, and a jack slipping off the point will punch a hole right through both surfaces. When the oleo strut is fully extended, check the wheel carefully for proper alignment. If it toes out or toes in, the nutcracker has probably been sprung and must be replaced. Check the wheel for side play, which would set up a dangerous vibration on takeoffs and landings. To inspect the attachment of the landing gear bracket to the wing spar, it is necessary first to loosen the wing band turnbuckle. This permits the wing band to be slipped to one side. Now you can remove the inspection cover plate. Inspect the wing spar and butt plates for possible checks and delaminations. See that there is no evidence of cracking in the bracket itself and that all attachment nuts are properly cottered. Check the attachment for play, which would indicate that the bolt holes in the spar are worn and a major repair job is called for. Check all the screws for tightness and proper safetying. Any side play in the nutcracker indicates worn bolt holes and the links must be replaced.
Remove the snap ring and dust cover and carefully examine the wheel. Corrosion will ruin a wheel quicker than anything. If you find spots of corrosion, clean them off and paint over with zinc chromate. Rocks and rough landings also can damage a wheel. Keep your eyes open for trouble during this inspection. Cracks in the wheels start small and grow fast. Examine anything that looks suspicious. And if you find evidence of cracking, replace the wheel at once. Every 100 hours, it is necessary to remove the wheels and clean and inspect the bearings. Remove the snap ring, the dust cover, the hub cap, and the retaining nut. Defective wheels are a serious menace during landing and taking off. The loss of a wheel often means the loss of a plane. Think of that when you're inspecting the wheels. In removing the wheel, take hold of it in such a way that your palm covers the hub. This prevents the bearing from falling out onto the ground. Remove the outboard bearing and place it on something clean and free from grit. The inboard bearing is held in place by a snap ring. Remove the felt grease retainer and the bearing. To clean the bearings, wash them thoroughly in a quick drying solvent that leaves no residue. Gasoline is good, but be sure the pan is clean and free of grit. Do a thorough job of washing using a brush to clean the old grease from between the rollers. Check the bearings carefully for excessive wear. See that the rollers are in good condition and that they turn freely and smoothly. And that the racers are thoroughly clean. Replace the bearing if there is any indication of failure or binding. Clean the brake drum and examine it for wear and damage. By rubbing the fingers across the drum, you can easily detect scoring. If the drum is badly worn or damaged, the entire wheel must be replaced. Wipe the hub free of old grease and examine it carefully for signs of wear and defects. This is a visual inspection and calls for good judgment. Remember that the wheels turn at a terrific speed during takeoffs and landings. Any defect that will cause the wheel to turn off true will set up dangerous vibrations when operating at high speed. Clean the axle and outboard side of the brake assembly. Remember that exposed grease will collect grit and cause excessive wear to any moving part. Inspect the brake assembly for security of attachment and general condition of the lining. If broken liner springs, sheared rivets, or bent flanges are discovered, replace the brake assembly before the airplane is flown again. After lubricating the bearings with the specified grease, remount the wheel. Carefully reinstall the bearing and replace the grease retainer, being sure it is free of grit and is not glazed.
While rotating the wheel slowly, tighten the hub nut until you feel the bearings just beginning to bind. Then back off the nut until the wheel runs free. That's the proper setting for the bearings. They rotate freely, but they have no side play. The hub cap on this type of wheel fits very close over the nut. Therefore, in cottering the nut, bend the pin clear back. If it projects the slightest amount, it will drag. And the next time the plane is taxied, it'll cut a hole right through the hub cap. When you replace the dust cover on a wheel, be satisfied that that wheel is in top condition. A defective wheel can crack up a ship just as easily as can a defective engine or flight surface. Before you sign the sheet, are you satisfied that the landing gear is in perfect operating condition? All right, then give it your okay. The tail gear of these primary trainers comes in for its share of rough landings too. The shock absorbing mechanism is similar to that of the main landing gear. It consists of a cylinder containing a piston with oil valves in its face. Two coil springs, one inside the other, seat on the top of the cylinder. The assembly is contained in a splined housing and the cylinder is charged with oleo fluid. The tail wheel is linked to the rudder and is steered by operating the rudder pedals. However, by kicking the rudder into either extreme position, the steering mechanism is disengaged, allowing the wheel to be reversed for backing the airplane. Here's the way this mechanism operates. A locking pin engages the tail gear assembly, causing it to turn with the rudder. As either extreme position is reached, a cam forces the pin back. The assembly is then free to rotate through one complete revolution before the pin automatically re-engages. Now the wheel and rudder again operate together. Before starting the inspection of the tail gear, see that the wheels are securely chocked. Raise the tail of the ship and center the stand squarely under the jack point. Tie weights to the rear lift handles and you're ready to start. Always begin your inspection with a thorough cleaning of the mechanism. As you go, keep your eyes open for obvious defects, cracks or bends, the failure of parts or missing safety wire and cotter pins. If the oleo fluid is leaking, disassemble the entire gear and find the trouble. The assembly should be free to swing back and forth. If it doesn't, the main attachment bolt is frozen. And landing the ship will throw such a strain on these braces that they will soon break. See that the steering mechanism disengages, rotates freely and smoothly, and re-engages properly. Inspect the drag link for possible breaks and the bushings for excessive wear. Apply side pressure to the lower part of the assembly. If play is noticed, the trunnion is worn. Or if, when you rotate the assembly, 
An eccentric motion is noticed at the trunnion. The strut is probably bent, and the entire assembly must be replaced. Give the entire assembly a thorough lubrication. Apply the specified oil to the cam roller. It must operate freely at all times, or injury to the cam will result. Using a pressure gun, grease the fitting in the trunnion, the fittings on each side of the lower and on each side of the upper drag link. Do not apply grease to this fitting. It is the oleofluid filler plug. To check the fluid level in the cylinder, the assembly must be in the extended position. Remove the fluid level plug and to prevent the fluid from running down onto the tire and wheel, wrap a rag around the strut. Pump fluid into the strut until it runs out the upper hole. That brings it up to the proper level. Now clean the strut carefully and you're finished with the 25 hour inspection. Every 50 hours, in addition to the inspections of lesser periods, the tail gear must be checked for wear due to the accumulation of grit. A torn boot must be mended or replaced as soon as you discover it. Otherwise, quantities of dirt will be admitted to the tail gear. This is particularly true if the ship is operating in sandy or dusty country. In such regions, the abrasive action of grit will cause excessive wear of all moving parts. Always be sure that oil, grease, and oleofluid are carefully wiped off. They only serve to accumulate more grit, and the result is like using emery stone for bearing surfaces. Check the cam roller for freedom of operation. Rust or dirt may cause it to freeze, and damage to the cam will result. A good mechanic is always on the lookout for trouble. Find it and fix it before it gets a start on you. Every 200 hours, the tail wheel must be completely disassembled for an inspection of the bearings, the tire, and the metal parts. If the airplane is operating in damp, muddy country or near the ocean, this inspection had better be performed every 100 hours. To disassemble the wheel, it is necessary first to deflate the tire. Removal of the small curved plate at the side of the wheel will expose the air valve. In removing the core, use a tool designed for the purpose. Otherwise, you're liable to damage the threads inside the stem. As the tire deflates, it is possible to force the side plate down, revealing the lock ring. Removing this ring allows the side plate to be lifted off. Now the tire, which is an ordinary drop center type, can be removed from the hub. Inspect the tire and tube for breaks, cuts, and signs of wear. If the rubber is worn through to the fabric at any point, the tire must be replaced at once. A blowout may easily cause a serious landing accident. Continue the disassembly of the wheel 
by removing the spacer from each side of the hub. Now, spread a clean rag to catch the bearings when you knock them out. Insert a drift or other suitable tool through the hub. The tool used should be made of Dural, brass, or fiber to prevent injury to the bearings. When you tap out the grease retainer and bearing, take it easy. Bearings are precision made, and they won't stand up under the beating some fellows give them. This mechanic taps them lightly, and he gets results just the same. Clean off and examine the felt grease retainers. Their purpose is to keep grease in the bearing chamber and away from the tire. If they appear glazed and hard, or if they are saturated with grease, replace them with new retainers. To clean the bearings, always use a clean solvent that dries quickly and leaves no residue. Check the bearings for smooth operation of the rollers and races. Binding, defective rollers, or signs of wear call for new bearings. Don't wait till they're ready to fall apart before you replace them. Clean the wheel thoroughly. If all grease and dirt is not removed, it may hide a serious crack in the metal. It's careful attention to details like this that makes a good job of servicing. Check the wheel for cracks and wear, or if spots of corrosion are found, they should be cleaned and painted with zinc chromate. If not checked at once, corrosion will ruin a wheel in short order. Best of all, don't let it get started. At this time, the drag link and trunnion should be inspected for wear and general condition. Remove the pins holding the drag link to the trunnion. Check the drag link for side play, which would indicate worn bolt holes and see that the trunnion revolves freely and smoothly. Inspect the holes in the lower end of the link and in the trunnion for elongation due to wear. The holes should allow little or no side play when the pins are inserted. That looks okay. Now, reassemble the gear and lubricate it. When the wheel bearings have been carefully greased and the wheel reinstalled, see that there is no side play and that the wheel revolves true. If it doesn't check up, Add spacers until the trouble is corrected. When you finally sign the inspection sheet, you're telling your pilot that the airplane is in first-class operating condition. He has respect for your judgment and faith in your work. Try to live up to it. Aircraft engines and propellers undergo terrific strains during periods of operation. Strong vibration and high temperatures naturally have their effect on all the parts concerned. Bolts and rivets work loose. Metal parts crack. And wooden propellers tend to split. 
Every 25 hours, the propeller must receive a thorough checkup. But before you start, before you even touch the propeller, be sure the switch is off. Okay, go ahead. During taxiing or taking off, small pebbles often fly up and strike the prop. The resulting dents or cracks are usually most severe along the trailing edges where the wood is thin. Examine the blades carefully in this area. Inspect the metal tips for condition of the rivets. If they show evidence of cracking loose, the prop must be replaced. Examine the metal leading edge for cracks and severe dents that might throw the propeller out of balance. Also, see that the wood is free of cracks and dents, and that the laminations are not separating. Look for defects in the varnish. If water gets through to the wood, it will cause it to swell and warp. This is most likely to happen in the area where letters have been stamped into the wood. Inspect the propeller hub flanges for cracks. They usually start at the bolt holes and work out to the edge. The discovery of any of these defects is good reason to replace the propeller. Here is the best way to check the prop for looseness. If there is play, you'll have to tighten the hub nut. First, uncotter and remove the clevis pin. Oh, don't lose that washer. You'll need it later. There you are. Now insert a substantial propeller bar through the holes in the nut. Use only your hands to tighten the nut. Never pound the bar with a hammer. Okay. Now reinstall the clevis pin and cotter it. The head of the clevis pin always goes on the inside of the hub nut. Then, if the cotter pin should come out, Centrifugal force will hold the clevis in position until the engine has been cut and the propeller stops turning. Finish the job by giving the hub nut a final turn to lock the clevis pin in place. At the end of 50 hours flying time, besides the inspections of lesser periods, it is necessary to check the propeller hub flange nuts for tightness. You don't have to remove the cotter pins to make this inspection. Check the nuts with an open end wrench and any looseness will show up. That one will stand tightening. Now remove the cotter pin and take up on the nut. Looseness of these flange nuts may be caused by shrinkage of the wood in dry climates. Whatever the cause may be, it's good practice to check the prop for warping or being out of track whenever the nuts are found to be loose. To perform this inspection, a tracking device is used. Be sure the brakes are set and the wheels chocked so there's no chance of the plane moving. Adjust the propeller so its tip just touches the pointer of the tracking device. To be of any value at all, this check must be absolutely accurate. So take your time and do it right. Now pull the other blade through and check its distance from the pointer. Set its position exactly and take your hands off before making the check. Otherwise, you might be pressing the tip slightly towards or away from the pointer. 
Any variation over one-eighth of an inch calls for a new prop. This prop's okay. The PT-19A is powered by a six-cylinder inverted Ranger engine, designated as the L440 series. The PT-23 uses a Continental seven-cylinder radial engine, designated as the R670 series. The inspections of the two engines are very similar, the principal differences being in the location of various units. We'll point out these differences as we come to them. Every 25 hours, besides performing the usual daily inspection, remove the cowling for a thorough check of the engine, its lines, and accessories. Start off by tightening the induction manifold nuts. If these nuts are not kept absolutely tight, leakage will occur at the parting surfaces. This, in turn, robs the engine of power. The proper cooling of the engine depends on the inter-cylinder baffle plates, which must be kept tight and in their proper positions. If they've worked loose, go to the other side of the engine and tighten the baffle screws. Okay, that took care of it. See that the terminal wires are securely attached to the spark plugs. If any are found to be loose, slightly pinch the spark plug leads. Don't overdo it. There, that'll hold for a long time. Remember, there is a set of plugs on both sides of the engine. Don't miss any. Check the air intake elbow for security of attachment and inspect the coupling hose and its clamps for condition and security. See that the carburetor air cleaner housing is securely attached and is not damaged or cracked, especially at sharp corners. In the PT-23, the air scoop is located at the top of the engine and the air cleaner is just behind it. Inspect them in the same way for any defects and for security of attachment. In both types of engines, always be sure that all drain and vent pipes extend below the bottom cowling. Otherwise, explosive fumes may collect in the engine section. Replace any pipes that are too short. And while we're on the radial engine, let's consider a few points. On this engine, the starter shaft has a universal joint. If it is too loose, it may strike the cross brace just below it, causing excessive wear to both members when the engine is cranked. Finally, tighten the oil seal nuts at the ends of the push rod housings. These nuts should never be allowed to show any sign of leakage. By the end of 50 hours flying time, vibration and wear will be having a noticeable effect on the engine. Check the oil and fuel lines for security of attachment, loose clamps, and leakage at the coupling. There's a leak starting in the oil line. In tightening loose clamps, take up on them until just before the rubber starts to squeeze out. That'll stop the leak and won't damage the hose. Throughout the engine section, various members have been taped together to prevent chafing. This tape must be kept secure and in good condition at all times. Don't hesitate to replace any taping that seems to be coming loose. 
Clean off the members carefully before applying new tape. You'll do a better job if you cut off a piece of tape the size you need and roll it into a small roll. This is much easier to work with in the cramped space of the engine section. For this job, fold the other end of the tape into a small pad. Insert the pad between the two members to cushion them. Then bind them tightly with the rest of the tape. This stuff is cheap compared to a new primer line or oil line, so use plenty of it. Engine oil will quickly ruin tape, so oil proof the job with a heavy coat of shellac. There's a good taping job. The constant strains of weight and vibration are likely to cause cracks in the engine mount, especially at the welds. Once they start, they soon produce a dangerous condition. Carefully check every weld in the mount. And if you find cracks, no matter how small, the mount must be replaced at once. The rubber grommets at the top of the engine mount help to absorb vibration. They must be firm and alive to function properly. If the rubber appears to be squeezing out, that's a sure sign they're ready for replacement. The same inspections should be carried out on the radial engine. Check all welds for defects and the rubber grommets for condition. Sheet metal parts, like the shroud, are subject to cracking, especially at bends and around rivets. The same thing applies to the cowling formers. And if these parts work loose, there's even greater danger of cracking. Another cause of damage is alternate heating and cooling. Therefore, defects may occur sooner or later in the welds of the exhaust system. Going back to the inline engine, check the exhaust stacks for security. Whether or not the stacks are found to be secure, it's good practice to tighten the attachment nuts. If these nuts are allowed to become loose, the flanges will warp and crack as they expand and contract. Finally, put in a set of the proper type of serviceable spark plugs, and you've finished the 50-hour inspection. The proper functioning of the engine controls is vitally important. See that the action of the throttle lever and its linkage to the carburetor is smooth and free of binding. As the lever is moved to either extreme position, the throttle should strike the corresponding stop at the carburetor. With the throttle set in either extreme position, there must be 3 sixteenths of an inch clearance between the hand lever and the end of the quadrant. See that the mixture control moves freely and that it functions properly throughout its linkage. Pull the carburetor heat control full out and see that the lever on the heater hits the corresponding stop. Check it at the off position and again be sure the lever hits the stop. Inspect all the control linkage for bent rods, lost motion, and binding. See that they are clean and free of grit. Since these controls are connected by sealed bearing assemblies, they never require lubrication. 
This pilot's life depends on the proper functioning of his plane. That, in turn, gives you the responsibility for his life. It's a big order, but not too big, if you perform every inspection to the best of your ability and never leave anything to guesswork. The PT-19A and the PT-23, the fixed flight surfaces are made entirely of wood. However, the movable surfaces, the ailerons, the elevators, and the rudder, have aluminum alloy frames covered with fabric. These surfaces are controlled by individual systems of push-pull tubes. The tubes are linked with torque shafts and bell cranks, and all connections are fitted with packed and sealed ball bearings, which require no lubrication. The aileron and rudder trim tabs are ground adjusted. The elevator trim tab control is the only cable operated system on this plane. From the hand crank in either cockpit, Piano wire cables run the length of the fuselage to the elevators. Here they connect to the gear assemblies which operate the trim tabs themselves. The wing flaps are manually controlled by a hand lever, one in each cockpit. The 25-hour inspection of the flight controls is chiefly a visual inspection, looking for the results of strain and wear. Examine the ailerons for general condition of the skin and trailing edge. See that the hinges are free of cracks, corrosion, and obvious defects. Their movement should be smooth and free of binding. Check for over-travel. Remove and examine the hinge bolt. Feel every hinge for security of attachment. Since the brackets are bolted to the wooden spar, any play indicates that shrinkage of the wood has distorted the bolt holes, thus loosening the attachment. Hold the push-pull tube firmly and move the aileron up and down. This will show up any play in the control linkage. See that all nuts are cottered and that all parts work smoothly and are free of defects. At the wing panel gap, the aileron controls are connected by an idler. This fitting should move smoothly and without binding. Lost motion anywhere on the linkage indicates that some of the parts are worn. The trouble must be traced to its source and the worn parts replaced. The inspection of the elevators is identical to that of the ailerons. See that they have full free movement and that the hinges are free of cracks and defects. Check the elevator trim tab hinges for play and see that the nuts are tight and safety. While you're back here, see that the trim tab control cables have the proper tension. The operation of the trim tabs depends largely on the condition of their gear assemblies. The sprocket, the push rod worm, and the pulleys should operate smoothly and without binding. Also, see that these parts are never over oiled. Such a condition would cause grit to accumulate and ruin the gears. Inspect the rudder control fairing for dents which might bind the push-pull tube. The stabilizer attachment brackets must be rigidly inspected for condition, security, and proper cottering of the nuts. If cotter pins are found to be missing, check the nuts for tightness and re-cotter them at once. 
The attachment of the stabilizer to the fuselage depends entirely on these four brackets, two on each side. Therefore, the slightest effect in the attachment bolts or the brackets should be considered a dangerous condition. Your pilot is liable to be pretty unfriendly if the tail assembly blows off while he's upstairs. The inspection of the rudder is nearly the same as that of the ailerons and elevators. See that it moves freely and easily, and that the hinges are not cracked or otherwise defective. In handling the rudder, always take hold of it where the trailing edge joins a rib. That's a good way to avoid damage to the trailing edge. Feel for play in the hinges or insecurity of their attachment. The inspection holes along the right side of the fuselage give access to the rudder and elevator control linkage and to the elevator trim tab cables and turnbuckles. Adjustments in the length and tension of the cables are made here. Also, through these holes, you can get at the pulleys. Ease the cables away from them and see that they turn freely without binding and are not chipped or broken. Inspect the cables for broken or frayed wires, but don't use your hands. Pull a rag along the cables and any frayed wires will snag in the cloth. This will save your hands from a lot of painful cuts. If you discover more than six broken wires per inch, the cable must be replaced. Now check the flight controls in both cockpits. Operate the trim tab control crank and see that the tabs respond properly. When the red figure four shows on the indicator, the tabs should be in the neutral position. Operate the rudder pedals and check for lost motion or binding and see that the rudder responds properly. The pedals must be adjusted so that when they are neutralized, the rudder moves into the center position. In the same way, inspect the stick control. If you discover any lost motion or binding in the linkage, trace down the trouble and make the necessary adjustments. Be sure that when you center the controls, all the surfaces, ailerons, elevators, and rudder, move into the neutral position. At least every 100 hours, the drain holes in the fixed surfaces must be cleaned out. If moisture cannot drain from inside the wings, it may weaken their structure, resulting in a dangerous condition. A tool like this is recommended for cleaning the holes. It scrapes mud and dirt away from the inside surface and ensures free drainage. During wet, muddy weather, this operation had better be performed every 50 hours. The pilot must depend on the flight controls more than on any other system on the plane. If the motor conks, it'll be a dead stick landing. But if the controls jam, it'll be a dead pilot. It's your job to keep them flying. of care, aircraft engines suffer considerably from wear and rapid changes of temperature. At certain specified intervals, the engine must be exchanged for a new or recently serviced one. The operations of removal and installation are the same, except that the order is reversed. Therefore, we will use installation as our example. 
The new engine should first be thoroughly cleaned, then set up on a temporary mount. This will simplify the installation of accessory parts, such as the spark plugs. Serviceable type plugs are specified for this purpose, but be sure you are using the type of plug approved for this engine. Here the starter has been installed and is being bolted into place. This accessory, together with the fuel pump, must be installed while the engine is on the temporary mount. It's a tough job to put these parts on after the engine is in the plane. As you finish each job, safety it, if it requires safetying. Don't let it go until later. That's a sure way to forget one. Even though the engine has just come out of storage, it's a mighty good precaution to examine the oil screens or any foreign matter. This is the main screen, located just above the oil pump. See that it's not clogged with dry grease or rubber shavings from the hose connections. In this engine, there are three finger screens having magnetic plugs two at the sump underneath the engine, and this one just below the main screen. Inspect the magnets carefully. If particles of metal are found on them, there's probably an internal failure, and the engine should be rejected. Factory and depot inspections are pretty thorough, but once in a while something gets by them. There's no such thing as being too careful in your inspections. When you receive an engine from the factory, or out of storage, you will find that holes entering the engine have been covered with shipping plates. Here, the exhaust ports have been covered with a strip of plywood. Its purpose is to keep moisture and dirt out of the engine. Don't remove these cover plates until you are ready to make an installation. Before attaching the exhaust stacks, it is necessary to install the shroud, because you can't put the shroud on after the stacks are installed. Check the engine mount for play at the points of attachment. Give it the works, and if you detect any looseness, check for worn bolts or bolt holes. Also, at this time, wash down the firewall using a brush and the specified solvent. While the oil system is disassembled, flush out the units with a cleaning solvent. Engine sludge and bits of rubber from the hose connections may collect in the lines obstructing the flow of oil. If the lines are not flushed occasionally, the entire oil system may become seriously inefficient. The oil cooler also must be flushed out and inspected. The purpose of the cooler is to reduce the temperature of the oil returning from the engine to the storage tank. But as the oil heats up, it is automatically routed through the cooler. The function is controlled by this thermostatic valve. See that it's free of obvious defects and isn't gummed up with sludge. Now, unsafety and remove the plug from the top of the tank. This will enable you to pour solvent completely through the cooler. That's the only way to give it a thorough flushing. Use plenty of solvent and keep pouring it through the cooler until it comes out looking clean. In flushing out the oil tank, use several quarts of solvent 
to dissolve the sludge that usually collects there. If the tank is off the plane, your job is easy. But usually, the tank will remain attached to the firewall. In this case, you'll have to rock the plane to splash the solvent around to all parts of the tank. Open the cock and drain out the solvent and the sludge. Now pour a quart of clean oil into the tank and let it drain. That will take out the excess solvent and any remaining sludge. Now you're ready to swing the engine onto the mount. Notice that the chain hoist is attached to the lift ring at the top of the engine. Carefully guide the engine into place until the engine feet are directly over the bolt holes in the mount. Now, lower the engine into place, but don't rest all its weight on the mount. Line up the bolt holes with a drift of suitable size. Don't use the bolts themselves for this purpose, or you'll damage the threads. The bolts must fit snug, so you'll probably have to pound them home with a mallet. Gradually lower the engine as you line up each of the four mount bolts. When the last bolt is driven home, the entire weight of the engine should be resting on the mount, and the chain hoist can be removed. It is very important that the first connection you make is the wire leading from the switch to both the left and right magnetos. Make the connections tight while you're doing it, and you'll avoid trouble later. There's only one ground wire, and it should be attached to the engine bolt just below the left magneto. With these wires connected and the switch off, there's no chance of the engine kicking over unexpectedly. That's why these connections must be made first. Before you mount the carburetor on the engine, check the butterfly for smooth operation. Loosen the locking screw and set the idler screw so the butterfly is open about 1 16th of an inch in the idling position. This ensures that the engine will receive enough fuel to run when you first start it. You can adjust the idling speed later. Now mount the carburetor on the engine. Take up on the nuts evenly on both sides until the carburetor is tight against the induction manifold flange. Connect the throttle control rod to the throttle arm at the carburetor. Unless the entire control linkage has been disassembled, or unless one of the rods has become bent, there is no reason to make adjustment in the linkage. However, should adjustment be necessary, the rods can be shortened or lengthened. This is accomplished by screwing the threaded fitting in or out of the rod before connecting it to the carburetor. The adjustment of this linkage is correct when the throttle is closed against the throttle stop and the hand throttle in the cockpit has 3 16th inch clearance from the end of the quadrant. 
In the same way, connect the mixture control rod. Since all of these rods are joined with packed and sealed ball bearings, they never require lubrication. In fact, grease and oil should be kept off the linkage or it will just gather dirt and grit. In connecting the fuel lines, adjust them so there is a slight clearance between the tubes to take up vibration. Then slip the rubber hose coupling over the joint. Tighten the clamps until just before the rubber starts to squeeze out. In all inspections of the fuel and oil lines, it is assumed that if the couplings do not leak and if the rubber is not squeezing out, the tension of the clamps is okay. This is the fuel pressure line leading from the carburetor to the engine gauge unit. This should be inspected for cross threads. Next, Connect the line from the fuel pump to the carburetor. Allow the proper clearance and slip the hose coupling into place. Adjust the spacing of the lines within the coupling and tighten the clamps. Continue hooking up the fuel system by connecting the main line from the strainer to the pump. This is a rubber hose and should be visually inspected for cracks and defects before you make the connection. Then connect the line from the wobble pump to the T fitting in the main line. And finally, the runoff line from the pump. In connecting fittings like this one, be very careful not to cross thread them or you'll be in for a lot of grief. Here, the primer line is being connected to the manifold. This line is a small copper tube and won't stand too much bending. So be careful of it during operations like changing the engine. This shipping plate covers the hot spot flange and is the point of attachment of the hot spot outlet pipe. Before you install the pipe, see that the attachment bracket is in good condition. Engine vibration often causes it to crack and break. Then the unsupported pipe soon works loose. Install the pipe and tighten the flange bolts and the bracket clamp. The installation of the exhaust system is best accomplished by two men. One to install the parts and the other to hold them in place until the manifold is put on. There must be a gasket for each outlet, and the gaskets must be new. Install the manifold, but be careful not to damage the threads on the bolts. It is very important that the retaining nuts be tight. If they are not, the flanges will be damaged as they expand and contract with engine temperature changes. Connect the tachometer shafts to the couplings at the top rear of the engine. It is good practice, before the connections are made, to pull the shafts out of the housing cables and inspect them. 
Before replacing them, lubricate the shafts with the specified grease. While you're up here, connect the starter extension shaft. It must be clean and free of rust or excess grease before installing it. The holes in the shaft and the starter fitting must be lined up. Then the bolt can be slipped through. See that there is not too much play at this connection. If the holes are excessively worn, the worn parts should be replaced. The installation of the oil cooling system is not difficult. The parts of the system, the air intake, the cooler, and the air exhaust should be placed in position and the attachment straps clamped around them. The straps grip the air ducts where they contact the ends of the cooler. See that the padding is in place and tighten up the straps. It may be necessary to adjust the positions of the air ducts again later when you're ready to install the cowling. But see that they're secure for now. The oil lines are installed in the same way you installed the fuel lines. Slide the hose connection over the joint, space the tube slightly, and tighten the clamps. Here again, take up on the clamps until just before the rubber starts to squeeze out. Since the hose couplings do not have liners, be very sure they are in perfect condition and free of cracks. This is the crankcase breather tube connected at the top of the engine. It also is joined with a hose coupling and the connection is made in exactly the same way as the fuel and oil line connections. In this case, however, turn the clamp screws to either side so they won't chafe on the top cowling. Here the oil pressure line is being connected. It leads from the pressure side of the oil pump to the engine gauge in each cockpit and indicates the pressure of the oil as it is pumped into the engine. The installation of the nose cowl requires careful fitting. Some adjustment of the air intake duct may be necessary to get a snug fit to the cowl. Also, the carburetor air intake, which has remained attached to the cowl, must line up with the intake elbow. Then the rubber coupling can be slipped over the joint and the clamps tightened. Space the clamps so that the ends of the coupling are visible. This ensures a good grip on the rubber. Connecting the carburetor heat control cable is sometimes a tricky job. With the control at the off position in the cockpit, make the connection so the door in the air cleaner housing is closed. Then clamp the cable between the washers on the valve lever and tighten the bolt. Now tighten the support brackets that attach the cable to the engine mount and see that the installation is secure. Okay. That works all right. Now you're ready to install the cowling formers. Inspect them visually for cracks or bends and condition of the padding. It is very important that the formers be tight and secure. Otherwise, engine vibration will soon work them loose and the entire cowling will be affected accordingly. The installation of the propeller is an exacting job 
leaving no room for error. Apply a coating of light oil to the spacer before installing it. Wipe some of the oil over the splines of the shaft as a protection against rust and slip the spacer on. Repeat the process with the split cone which clamps the prop tight against the shaft. Notice that the cone is installed tapered end out. Now install the prop itself, adjusting its position until the splines exactly match. Then the prop will slide on easily. Install the hub nut and see that the threads on both the nut and the shaft are in no way damaged. It is now necessary to tighten the nut with a propeller bar. Insert the bar through the holes provided and take up on the nut. Use only your hands for this operation. Never pound the bar with a hammer. Now install the clevis pin and cotter it. Insert the clevis pin so its head is on the inside of the hub nut. Then if the cotter pin should break or come out, Centrifugal force will hold the clevis pin in place until the engine has been cut and the propeller stops turning. When installing the hub bolt nuts, a torque wrench will be used. At this time, the magnetos should be inspected for the condition of the points. If they show evidence of severe pitting, the points should be replaced. Before putting the cowling on, it is necessary to ground test the new engine. Pull the prop through several revolutions and have a mechanic stand by with a carbon dioxide type fire extinguisher. Now warm up the engine at about 800 RPM. Then reduce idling speed and make any necessary carburetor adjustments. When the engine is warmed up, Increase the speed to about 1,200 RPM and check the engine gauge for proper temperature and pressure indications. See that there is no excessive drop in RPM when the engine is operated on either mag separately. If the loss exceeds 75 RPM, cut the engine and check the ignition system for probable cause. Install the engine cowling. As you go along, visually inspect the condition of the paint and see that the metal is free of any defect. Also see that the Zeus fasteners are intact and in good condition. The process of engine change is now complete. After 25 hours of operation, the induction manifold packing nuts should be tightened. And there goes your new engine, just as good as when it came off the line. Let's keep it that way.